Beloved community, this is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whether you are part of First Church, a joyful and justice-seeking church in the heart of our nation's capital, or whether you are a guest or friend joining us from many different locations, we welcome you to worship this morning as we continue our summer theme, A New Thing. I want to offer a special welcome this morning to our new friends, the youth from the Minnesota Conference of the United Church of Christ, led by the Reverend Kevin Brown and the Reverend Sherry Nelson. We are so grateful to have all of you here today. Thank you for coming. I also want to welcome Jesse Dolajan, who is the intern for Climate Hope. You may notice a Climate Hope postcard in your bulletin. We call our bulletins worship folders, in your worship folder. Uh, so please take note of that, and he will be speaking about that a little later in our service. We are grateful to all of you for your witness for justice this week, and we're just blessed to have you in our midst. For those who don't know me, I am Reverend Amanda Hendler Voss, senior minister here at First Church. In this hour of worship, may the ancient stories of scripture remind us of the new thing that God is doing among us. Here, may you encounter God's provision and grace as we journey together. While we worship in word and song, prayer and gratitude, may you discover with delightful surprise how the spirit of the living God is at work in you and in this beloved body of Christ. Reverend Sam will be out for the next few weeks on sabbatical. Please keep him and your fam his family in your prayers as he takes time for rest and restoration and as Brendan recovers from COVID. Today, we will have Sunday School for our children in the Christian Education Suite, led by Kim Darling and Susan Anderson, following the passing of the peace. And after worship, please join us for coffee hour in the Narthex, followed by Bible Workbench at noon in the chapel with our moderator, Andrew Hamilton. Friends, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome into the shared experience of worshiping the God whose love knows no bounds. Let us worship in spirit and in truth, beginning with our opening hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, that's number 43. Please rise in body or in spirit.
I'm so glad to be with you here this morning and a special welcome to our guests from Minnesota. It's amazing how things work out sometimes. I actually just got back Friday from a week in Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, <laughs> visiting a friend who is recovering from breast reduction surgery. And I really enjoyed your stay. It's the second time I visited her there. So um, I'm really grateful that you all are here. Now you might hear recovering from surgery and think that's so awful or I'm so sorry to hear that. But actually this surging was a real, surgery was a real blessing for my friend. She has wanted and needed this for a long time. And it will and, and already is giving her a new lease on life. Less back pain, easier breathing, literally weight lifted off of her chest. It was an honor for me to be a part of this experience with her. Over the week, there were certainly low points, moments where she was so tired from struggling to get peaceful sleep that it brought her to tears. And high points where all she could do was talk about how she could move more freely now, where she finally felt that she was becoming a version of herself that she's always imagined. So in those tougher moments, I tried to remind her that healing takes time. Venturing into a new version of yourself takes time and is never easy. To let yourself rest, heal, and then begin again. We are all so conditioned in this culture to hustle that when we're forced to slow down, it can be excruciating. But seeing her go through this process, committed to ecstatically welcoming herself into her new body, sent me into a state of reflection. Am I the version of myself that I want to be, whether physically, mentally, or spiritually? Maybe there's something new that I want to be doing. Maybe there's something I want to stop doing, and in that way, turn over a new leaf. I feel God's presence when I ask these questions, when I start to get nervous thinking about venturing into new or uncharted territory, knowing that whatever's in store, God will be there with me. And that does give me a sense of calm. Now, my friend is not particularly religious, but through my eyes, I could see the ways that God was helping her through this journey. He was there in her friend from the dog park who dropped off a hot meal. He was there in her fitness class friends that invited her to sit under the shade during class so that she could still be in community with them, even though she couldn't exercise yet. And he was present in me as I took her dog on countless walks and one experimental run <laughs> uh, throughout the week so that she could really focus on resting and recovering. So maybe you're not personally embarking on a new journey right now or looking to reimagine what you could be, but I bet you might know someone who is. God is always giving us opportunities to show up in the lives of others. So let us look for those opportunities this week to walk with each other and our communities as life changes and transforms us. Perhaps that brought you into a state of feeling God's peace the way that it did for me. And so now we will share 
the peace of Christ with one another with words such as peace be with you. And I would invite those joining us by Zoom, please feel free to turn on your video camera so that we can greet you as well. Peace be with you. Now you can. Now you can. Pass the peace. Peace. Peace, everybody. Peace, everybody. Happy Sunday. Peace, everyone. Nice seeing the full sanctuary, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, it's there. Full house. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, the people from Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Packing them in. <laughs> That's okay, Lucille. No, no problem. <laughs> First reading this morning is from Genesis 28, verses 10 to 22. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood by, beside Jacob and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all of the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and, and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the place Bethel. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And and of all that you give me, I surely give one-tenth to you.
This next reading comes from the letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 14 through 25. All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on we, your people, that we might hear your word for us today. Amen. There are moments in my life when God's voice rings clear like a bell. I'm convinced that this fullness of divine presence does not depend on anything I have done. In fact, I can't say why some experience profound spiritual encounters like the one described in today's text from Genesis and others do not. But when the veil between this world and God's realm grows thin, and I hear that still small voice, I hush my spirit and listen. When I see a burning bush, I turn aside and remove my shoes. There's something about an encounter with God that lifts the spirit into grateful wonder, so humbling. It can change your life in an instant. Some First Church folks have heard this story, but I think it's worth repeating. I was in college when it dawned on me that I might have to leave the church. My best friend, the only out lesbian on our Christian campus, challenged my choice of church. She said that when I chose to go to a church that did not accept her for who she was, it hurt her deeply. And that was all she needed to say. In truth, the church had stopped feeling like home long before that. I'd sit in the pews and flinch as they spoke of a God full of wrath demanding the blood of Christ. I'd close my eyes and translate the language used for God into something more authentic to my experience. After one particularly painful Sunday when I left the service hungry 
for more than the scraps my soul had received, I recall sitting on a curb in the parking lot and praying a cranky prayer. God, I prayed, I can't do this anymore. The gulf between the Jesus I love and the Jesus I hear about in church is so wide. I just don't think the church is for me. I looked up from my despairing prayer to see a rainbow arcing through the sky. That sign of covenant promise. And it was as if I heard God's voice say to me, it's okay, you don't have to come here again. To me, it meant the God I worshiped was so much bigger than any one congregation or denomination, bigger than any institution or tradition. God, I realized, is the most real thing. Everything else is clumsy imitation. It was a powerful spiritual experience, as if God was proclaiming me as beloved, as adopted, promising that when I walk through the waters, God will be with me and the waves will not overcome me, telling me, do not fear, for I have called you by name. You are mine. I never did return to that church, but God had other plans. We find Jacob on the run in today's text from Genesis. He had betrayed his brother, deceived his father, and stolen the birthright blessing. To escape his brother's fury, his parents advised him to leave. His journey became a pilgrimage when he encountered God's presence. He came to a certain place and decided to bed down for the night under the stars. He used a stone for a pillow and Falling into a deep sleep, he stepped into a liminal space where his dream transfigured into a vision. He saw a ladder extending from earth to the heavens with angels ascending and descending. He heard the voice of God saying, I am the God of your ancestors and all families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. It's remarkable how God can take a wildly dysfunctional family system warped by lies, deceit, and betrayal and continue to breathe blessing into it and through it. It's almost as if God doesn't require our perfection to work through us. It's remarkable how God can take the messes we make and use them still for good, not just in our lives, but in order to bless the world. When Jacob awoke, it dawned on him. God was not just in one place in his father's house. God was there too, and wherever he went, God would be there as well. This was a new spiritual wisdom bequeathed to Jacob as he set out on a long journey that would take him far from home, estranged from his family for years on end, a journey through which he would find love and create a family of his own. God is not just in one place. God is everywhere. There is no place on earth that can bar the gates of heaven. And because Jacob knew this truth here for the first time, he marked the place with a sacred ritual. He took the stone that was the resting place for his head and established a pillar. He sanctified the pillar by pouring oil over it and named the place Bethel, which means house of God. 
And then he made a promise to God. If you will go with me and keep me and give me my daily bread so that I return home in peace, then you will be my God. And I will surely give what I have to you. Sanctifying a place, naming it, vowing to trust in God and to return a portion of God's good gifts. These are faithful responses to divine encounter. God's presence with Jacob did not exempt him from facing the consequences of his actions. Jacob would soon learn how hard he had to work. He would be deceived and betrayed by the family into which he married, feeling what it's like to be on the other side of trickery. He would return home trembling with fear that his brother, who became a prosperous man, would never forgive him and might indeed still wish to kill him. God's presence doesn't resolve life's complexities or fix all that we've broken or magically wrench us out of intergenerational dysfunction. But God's undying faithfulness to behold us always as beloved children of adoption insists that the world will be blessed through us. And we will never go it alone. As the psalmist says, Where can I go from your spirit, O God? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. And because of this promise, that God is not just in one place, but God is in every place. Because God promises to go with us and to bless the world through us, we can claim our belovedness in God as our primal identity, our birthright as God's children and siblings with Christ. And so we have hope. Not because of what we see, wildfire smoke choking the skies, heat waves blanketing the land, oceans rising. Not because of what we see, white supremacy on the march, book bans, trans kids and immigrants used as political pawns, the fabric of our democracy frayed and weakened. Not because of what we see, as we groan inwardly with all of creation in labor pain, straining to birth this new thing that God is doing among us. Hope that is seen is not hope at all. But we hope for what we do not see because we trust God's promise. Years after my vision in that parking lot of a church, I heard about the United Church of Christ, which some call the last little house on the left on the road out of Christianity. <laughs> I was on that road, but someone left the light on. I crossed the threshold of the sanctuary and sat in the back pew, unsure of what I'd find. That first Sunday, that I worshipped in a UCC congregation, surely God was in that place. When it was time for the scripture reading, a woman rose and moved to the microphone. She confessed that she really struggled with one of the verses she was tasked with reading and had even asked the pastor if she could just skip that part. He had urged her to read the whole of it. And when she came to that part, that was difficult. Her voice caught in her throat and her chin trembled. It was 
the most honest reading of scripture I've ever witnessed. Her struggle was not swept under the rug, and so her struggle became our struggle as the pastor preached about what it means to love scripture, even as it reflects back to us all the brokenness and violence of human living. In that moment, I could never have known that the honest scripture reader would one day serve on the committee that held me in care as I pursued ordination, responding to God's call on my life. Surely God was in that place, and I did not know it. In that moment, it was none other than the house of God, the very gate of heaven. If I may be so bold as to speak directly to the youth in our midst who have made a pilgrimage here, to the heart of our nation's capital to speak their truth and call for a more just world for all of us. I pray you will mark this place and sanctify it and name it. I pray that God's promises will pour out on you so mightily that your cup overflows, quenching suffering and blessing all those you encounter. We need your voices. But even more, we need you to claim your belovedness in God for yourself, to know this is your primal identity, that no one, not anyone on Capitol Hill or in the highest court in the land or in the algorithms of social media, no one can separate you from God's love that is yours in Christ Jesus. That is your birthright. Claim it. Trust in it. Walk in its ways, knowing you are never alone. Surely God is in this place, and in every place you will go. May it be so. Amen. Friends, we've come to the time in our service where we invite you to give of your tithes and offerings to support the mission and ministry of this church. 
but also the greater United Church of Christ. We've been talking over the past couple weeks about the General Synod of the National Gathering that is the United Church of Christ and some of the resolutions that were passed there. Uh, some of those resolutions deal with the subject of eco-justice, which is what uh, Jesse Dolajon will be speaking about in just a moment when he offers, following our doxology, a moment for climate justice. There are many ways to give this morning. Uh, if you are present here in the sanctuary, there is an offering plate on the way out. You can always send a check in the mail. And for those who are joining us by Zoom, please click on the link that Lucille will be sharing and you can uh, give through our website, through Vanco or PayPal. I am grateful for the generosity of spirit of this community. I'm grateful that we are able to host such incredible groups as the ones we have today, um, as well as folks like Jesse. And, and I just want to note that Jesse's brief bio is in your worship folder, so please do take a moment to learn a little bit more about who he is and the work that he's up to, which he will speak to in a moment. We give God thanks that God takes of our gifts, however meager or however grand, and makes of them greater justice and peace and love in the world. And so I invite you now to uh, rise and body or in spirit and join me in singing the doxology. Good morning, everyone. First, I want to take a time to say thank you for welcoming me here today. This is my first time at this church, and I'm just keep telling everyone it's really beautiful. It's really nice to see everyone. It's just been a great experience so far. But yeah, my name is Jesse, as Reverend Amanda introduced me, and I'm currently a summer intern for the UCC's Climate Hope Internship Program. If you didn't get a chance to look in the bio, I was born and raised in Fort Washington, Maryland, and I currently attend Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. The goal of the Climate Hope Program is to inform others that the EPA is updating their environmental health standards. EPA, for those who don't know, stands for Environmental Protection Agency. Their main job is to review and create regulations for the environment to ensure it stays as healthy and sustainable as possible. Care for the environment is one of many things in our world which is simply not being addressed enough. Even though the consequences of ignoring it will have dire and long-lasting negative effects on our world. We have even experienced the results of air pollution firsthand not too long ago. Towards the beginning of June, the air quality reached a code red level in DC, meaning that some individuals could consider the air quality to be hazardous. I personally went into DC during this time period, and I noticed the air to be much more difficult and thicker to breathe than it was previously in May. The drop in air quality is an immediate example as to how pollution affects all of our lives. Poor air quality affects everyone, and the small taste which we received shows just how harmful it can be when not properly addressed. If we continue to allow for the environment to deteriorate at this rate, then air will only become more unbreathable. I do not want to live in a world like this. And I do not want to live in a world where people who suffer from asthma are afraid to go outside, or for my grandparents to be afraid of a heat stroke due to global warming. Many different groups of people suffer from pollution and poor health regulations across the country. For instance, 
Members of the black and brown community often do not have equal access to a clean environment and live in areas filled with heavy pollution. As for me personally, I was never seriously invested in the climate crisis until I started researching it earlier this year. And only now do I realize how serious of an issue this is to us and our world. We are all impacted by the climate crisis because we all live in this world. We are damaging our home on a regular basis and only now are we realizing the consequences of these actions. But I did not come here simply to tell you all about how dire a situation is, but to remind you all that the power to make a change starts with us. Just because we started this damage does not mean that we cannot stop it. Interns such as myself participating in the UCC's Climate Hope program are currently residing in various parts of the country. For example, I'm the only person in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Some people are in Washington State, Utah, Ohio. We have a little network going on. The Climate Hope Program is a national effort headed by the UCC in order for us to be a healthier nation. Once we speak to people such as yourselves, we ask them to review our petition and sign it. If you look inside the little pamphlets you were handed earlier to start at the start of a service, you should be able to see the petitions. There's a front and the back. A nice note is that the front picture of the world was actually, written by, was actually drawn by a grade schooler. It was picked as the cover of the card. It's a very beautiful illustration. And this petition aims to encourage the EPA to set the strongest standards imaginable beyond just air pollution. We were talking about stronger water regulation as well, which means better air and water quality and just things in general that would make our world, especially the US, a healthier place. So if the idea of a healthier world where both you and the people you love can live, we ask that you take a look at the card or the petition that should be in your hand or is placed in your pamphlet. Whenever you are ready, please write down your name, email address, phone number, and a short message about why having the strongest health standards possible is essential. If you not have a writing utensil, don't worry, I'll be in the back of the church after service, and I, can, I have a number of pens in my backpack, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have as well. If you are attending this service virtually, do not worry. You can email me your information. My UCC email is dolajohnj at ucc.org. It's spelled D-O-L-O-J-A-N-J -O -O at ucc.org. And if you are below 17, an email account is not necessary. We only ask for your name and a short message. An example of this message could be, I want the strongest health standards possible because I want to live in a world that is safe and healthy for everyone who lives here. Thank you so much for giving me time out of your day. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. When I was coordinating with Jesse a particular Sunday that he might come, I said, oh, you might want to come on July 23rd because we'll have a lot of people who might be able to sign these postcards. So I hope that you will consider that as a, a way to take direct action today. And we're so grateful, Jesse, for your presence here. Thank you. Friends, we've come to the time in our service where we share in the prayers of the people um, and go to God in prayer together, closing with the prayer of our Savior, which is printed in your worship folder. Um, I know we have a lot of folks here today, but I do, I would like for us to receive any joys or concerns um, from folks who are here in the congregation. And so I wonder, Moira, if you would be willing to take around the microphone. What prayers would you wish to share? Hi, this is LaTanya. Um, interesting enough, um, this late this week, um, a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine from seminary, found out um, that she has stage four colon cancer. Very young, in early 40s, and she happens to live in Minnesota. Uh, so there's a connection in that piece of it. So um, please pray for her as she um, 
found out this about this journey that she has now um, who knows how long to live in uh, as she tries to navigate that. Thank you, Latanya. We will pray for her. I just want to thank uh, God's grace. Uh, uh, last Friday, I celebrated 30 years of sobriety. And uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful journey. Congratulations, Robin. So proud of you. I just um, have a joy of uh, my parents attended this church uh, around 20 years ago, over 20 years ago in the late 90s when they were planning this. I remember them talking about this, of having this new sanctuary and, and housing and to be able to come here and see it uh, as, as a dream fulfilled. It's, it's wonderful to be here this morning. That's so amazing. Intergenerational blessing. So grateful. Thank you for sharing. I just like to share my hope that the deniers of climate change will see where they're wrong and join all of us in trying to rescue our climate. Thank you for your words. I truly appreciate that. Uh, I'm Reverend Sherry Nelson from the Minnesota Conference. Um, I just want to thank you all for giving us the chance to be here with you. I also want to ensure that we recognize that we also have the Northern Plains Conference with, with us, which is uh, the North Dakota branch of the United Church of Christ. And we are blessed with all that DC has to offer and share with us, and especially to be with all of you. Thank you. North Dakota in the house. <laughs> yes, yes. Welcome Northern Plains. Um, prayers for the Virginia students, trans students and non-binary students with the recent ruling from the governor and education. Thank you so much, Anna. Anyone else? Okay. I will also share a few that came in to me. Susan Goodman asks that we pray for support for her ex-husband, Bob, and their two sons, Joe and Mike, as Bob's dementia is now at the stage where it's time to find him memory care housing. So prayers for Bob and Susan and their sons. Um, friends, I also ask you to pray uh, for the family of Kamisha Thomas following the unexpected death of her uncle, Ricky. We give thanks that um, Nyla, her her friend uh, is, is here to fill in for Kamisha, and we will see Nyla next week as well. And so thank you, Nyla, for being here to welcome all those who walk through our doors. Prayers for Kamisha's family. Uh, I, I would ask for prayers of strength for the teachers and families of Florida uh, as the new teaching standards released this week teach that black people benefited from slavery. Uh, we really need to pray for the state of Florida and for all of those who are taking part um, in the educational system there. I would um, ask for prayers for uh, a friend of mine, a college friend of mine named Sarah, who uh, visited with us uh, on Easter. She and her wife are um, in the process of hopefully adopting a baby who was born yesterday. So prayers for the birth mother, um, for Sarah and her wife and, and their other child um, as they go through this process with integrity and care and love for one another. I would also ask us to continue to offer prayers of joy and support for the new general minister of the United Church of Christ, the Reverend Karen Georgia Thompson. I should say the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson as she begins her new position. Uh, may we truly support her. Let us pray. 
God of our ancestors, we come into your presence this morning with thanksgiving. Because you are our God and we are born of you. Our hearts rest in the knowledge that you etch your promises within each of us. Promises that are sacred and singular and eternal. No matter the circumstances of our lives, even when we face chaos or exile or despair, we can stand upon your promise to love us unconditionally, to accompany us on the journey, to redeem the world through the unfolding love of Jesus Christ. You promise, O oh God, to love us in all circumstances, and so we bring our burdens to you this morning. We confess the times we've been treated as less than your beloved children, and the times we've treated others this way as well. For strained relationships, for an earth that is under so much pressure, we ask your healing and forgiveness. For illnesses that burden us and the baggage that weighs us down, we ask for your comfort and companionship. For the persistent injustices of this world and the corruption of power, we ask that your wisdom and transformation would pour out upon us. Even as we name our burdens, O oh God, we can't help but lift our eyes to the horizon and remember that our help comes from you the creator of heaven and earth, for the beauty of love and celebrations with family, we give thanks for recovery, for anticipated new friends and familiar faces in our midst. We give gratitude to you for your love unleashed in this world, incarnate in Jesus. We ask that you would help us to see you everywhere as together we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, number 442, I'm Pressing on the Upward Way.
seated. Just a moment. Friends, before our final blessing, I want to remind you to check our newsletter website and Facebook page for announcements. If you are a new guest worshiping with us today who would like to stay connected to the life of our church, I invite you to complete a visitor's card. Nick is holding those blue cards up at the back, and we would be so grateful if you filled one out. If you're a visitor joining us on Zoom, that link to the digital visitor's form can be found in your worship folder. And now for just a few announcements. Following worship, join us in the narthex for coffee hour. Please don't forget to fill out your Climate Hope postcard and turn those in to Jesse. Uh, also, Andrew Hamilton will lead Bible Workbench at noon upstairs in the chapel. Anyone and everyone is invited to join him. Uh, next Sunday, I will be in Maine with my family. I am absolutely thrilled that the Reverend Laura Simmons, who is here in our midst, will serve as our preacher. I want to thank all who made today's service possible. Tom Sowers on sound, Lucille Dickinson, our Zoom moderator, our liturgist, Lindsay Swisher, who is even now out helping with our coffee hour, our ushers, Nan and Nick McConnell, uh, Nyla Dixon, our Sunday morning coordinator, Ellen Bushmiller, who set up the sanctuary and this beautiful stack of rocks. Um, our scripture readers, Karen Tramontano and Thaddeus Elliott, our soloist, our beautiful soloist, Marian Drake, accompanied by Lila Coilplay, our director of music ministry, Kim Darling and Susan Anderson, our Sunday school teachers, and also our coffee hour host, the Darling Lagama family. And now for our final blessing. Beloved community, may God bless you and keep you May God's face shine upon you and bring you peace. Go now to live justly, walk humbly, and love abundantly. Amen.